The Harrington's Daughter by Lois Lowry. They said the young woman next door was mad. The Harrington's daughter, they called her that, as if she had no name of her own, was mad. They meant crazy. That was all they said, that she was quite, quite mad, and I was to pay no attention. The shades on the south side of my grandparents' house, the side that faced the Harrington's, were drawn during the day so that the vast living room was dim. Grandmother said the shades were to be drawn so that the summer sun glaring in the rainless August wouldn't fade the oriental rug, but I knew better. The rugs had been faded all my life, and probably for a hundred years before that. They were the kind of rugs whose reds and blues were supposed to be muted by time and the thread of generations. The reason the shades were drawn was so that we would not be forced to glimpse the Harrington's daughter, who was quite quite mad. What happened to her? I asked grandmother. By her quick frown, I knew I shouldn't have asked. She had an unfortunate experience and completely lost her mind, grandmother murmured. She adjusted her glasses and took up her knitting from the basket beside her chair. Frederick, may we have some music? Grandfather turned on the radio and played with the dial until the sounds of a solo violin throbbed into the room. Brahms, he said with satisfaction and picked up the evening newspaper. I stared into the room, wondering what grandmother had meant by an unfortunate experience. Only this evening, the maid, serving dinner, had spilled some gravy on the linen tablecloth. That was an unfortunate experience, judging by grandmother's sharp look and the maid's intake of breath. My train had been late in arriving the day before. Another unfortunate experience, no doubt, causing grandmother to wait an extra 20 minutes to the in, at the sweltering Litterstrone station. My mother, their only daughter, was very ill. One more unfortunate experience. And why was they here unexpectedly? It happened so quickly. A routine doctor's appointment, some tests, some bad news, surgery. Don't worry, mother had said. I'll be home in a week. But something had not gone well. There were specialists now and consultants. It had turned into two weeks and then three. No visitors allowed, only my father. And he had sent me away to the silent house where the shades were drawn and a mad woman lived next door. I leafed through a magazine with a glum look. I had overheard my grandparents describe me to each other. Sullen, they said with distaste. And I suppose it was true. I was 17 and had not intended that my summer would be like this. I had intended that the summer between my high school graduation and my entrance into college would be one of friends and merriment and parties and pranks. The kind of summer my classmates were having back at home without me. It occurred to me suddenly that I, too, was quite, quite mad. Angry. Excuse me. I said to my grandparents, probably sullenly, and left the room. The kitchen, though, which I walked, was spotless and empty, not like all the other people's kitchens, like my own family's kitchen back home, where a bowl of apples was always on the table, where checkered dish towels dangled from oven door handles and hastily scrib scribbled notes and reminders were magnetically attached to the refrigerator by tiny metallic ladybugs and bananas. My grandparents' kitchen was unblemished white, like an operating room, now that the maid was finished for the evening, there was no visible food, no visible punctuation of color anywhere, only the dull black handles and the gleaming metal blades of knives attached to wall rack. The dull, churning hum of the dishwasher marred the silence. I unlocked the screen door that led to the back lawn and went outside. Grandmother's carefully tended flower gardens was still bloomed. Though they had suffered in the drought, tall, pink hollyhocks stood crowded against the wall of the house, beside rigidly staked white glands at their feet. Masses of pale do uh, dahlias drooped, needing rain. The unusually immaculate grass was brown in spots. There was a ban on watering. Grandmother had explained this morning, her voice taut with controlled dismay. The astil has died she had said, pointing to the brown fronds from which had been flowers in the shaded corner by her porch. 
Now in the twilight, all color was flattened to gray. There was no breeze. Hello? The voice startled me, and I turned to the fence, mounded with honeysuckle vines, to see the Harrington's daughter looking at me. I'd never seen her before, though I had met her parents previous summers. They were older than mine, with no children left at home, but their daughter, the mad woman who was staring at me now above the honeysuckle, was quite young. Twenty-five, perhaps? It was hard to tell. Her hair was in a long braid, and she was dressed in a cotton robe loose around her. She was thin and tall, not pretty, but attractive, with dark, big dark eyes. Hello, I replied, and went to the fence so that we faced each other. What's your name? she asked. Her voice was little more than a whisper. Nina, I'm visiting my grandparents. What's your name? She laughed a low, breathy chuckle. Secret, she said. Did she mean that secret was actually her name or that her name was a secret? I didn't feel that I could ask. It's hot, isn't it? I said instead. Is it? She looked around as if I had called her attention to something she had missed. I don't feel. Then she turned away and I saw suddenly that her hands were filled with flowers. The Harrington's yard was not manicured like grandmother's, not carefully tended, but there were flowers there, thick and tangled with weeds. While I watched, she went to a clump of asters and wrenched some blossoms loose. It might have been here, I heard her say. This might have been the place. A door opened and a rectangle of gold light appeared at the Harrington's darkened lawn. I saw Mrs. Harrington appear in the doorway, peering into her yard, and I heard her call to her daughter. Come in now. We didn't know where you were. You mustn't run off like that. Daddy was worried. It was as if she spoke to a child. Like a child, the young woman went obediently up the steps to her mother. I had to get flowers, I heard her say. I need flowers still. I can't find... No more now, her mother had told her before she closed the door behind them. No more flowers. I went back into the house where Brahm still played. My grandmother still knit. My grandfather had finished his paper and was turning to a book. Later, my father called, as he did each night, to say there was no change. My grandmother introduced me dutifully to people my age, great nieces of friends, the son of the Episcopal minister, I spent an interminable evening with a girl who talked endlessly of horse shows and went to the movies one night with the minister's son, who was younger than I and idiotically proud of having been, been expelled from prep school. I played the piano in my grandmother's high ceiling music room. I read, I wrote letters, I took walks. One night, late as I was preparing for bed, there were screams from the house next door. I stood, stricken, my hands frozen where they had been buttoning my nightgown, and listened through the open curtain window. They were not screams of terror, but of grief, terrible anguish cries that rose again and again, finally subsiding in sobs. No one mentioned it at breakfast, yet surely my grandparents had heard. Finally, I said, The Harrington's daughter was screaming last night. Did you hear her? Grandmother shifted uncomfortably in her chair while she stirred her tea. She nodded, I thought for a moment, that she would speak of the weather, of the relentless heat, of the lack of rain, of the disastrous effect on her dahlias. Her parents called to apologize this morning, she said. They what? I was shocked. Apologized? Did I hear you correctly? It's very embarrassing for them, Grandmother replied. Tragic, she added finally. What happened to her? I asked. The question, though I asked in a normal way, seemed loud in the silent dining room against the clink of silver spoons. She lost her child. For a moment, I pictured a small child misplaced somehow, its mother searching the house and yard, calling its name. But I knew, of course, this is not what grandmother had meant. Grandfather folded his newspaper and set it aside. It was a terrible accident, he said, on a boat. He stood, preparing to leave for his office. His briefcase waited on the mahogany table in the hall. I'm not sure I'm following this, I said loudly. The woman's child died and her parents are embarrassed? Is that what you're saying? 
Grandfather looked at me. Embarrassed was the wrong word, he said slowly. They're helpless. You'll understand that better when you're older. He went to the dining room doorway and then turned back. The paper says there's a chance of rain soon, he said before he left the room. That evening, thunder rumbled in the distance and the air was oppressively still. I wandered again into the dark yard. I wandered again into the dark yard and saw that the woman had come to think of a secret was standing alone on the other side of the fence. Her hands were empty. Almost without thinking, I went to grandmother's garden and began to pull a few of the remaining blossoms from plants there, the wilting pink hollyhocks, the limp glads, the dahlias with browning buds that would never open. All of them I gathered in my arms, then I opened the gate at the end of the fence and took the flowers to her. These are for you, I told her. I wish there was something more I could give you. She remembered my name. You're Nina, she said. Thank you, Nina. I nodded. Do you have a baby? She asked in her low whisper. No, I'm only 17. Someday you will. Her face had no expression. I hope so. Mine is named John. He'll be too soon. I didn't say anything. She stroked the flowers that she held and touched them to her face. She turned away from me and I thought she was going back to the house, but she stood still and began to talk in a low voice. He was such a bright little boy, Johnny, but I didn't know he could unbuckle the strap. She looked back at me and noticed the belt around the waist of my dress. Just like yours. A little buckle, just like that. Unbuckle it, she commanded me in a fierce whisper. I obeyed her and undid my belt. It slid loose, and I held it in my hands, and I looked at her. She laughed oddly. But you won't disappear, she said. Would you like me to take you inside? I asked in confusion. She moved away from me fearfully. Oh, oh no, she said. I can't go in. I can't go back. I have to keep looking. She glanced around her feet at the withered grass. But it's all, but it all looks alike. The water. I think it was there. And she dropped the spray of flowers to the ground. But it looks like the same here. And she dropped another in another spot. For a moment, she wandered around the yard, murmuring and dropping flowers. In my mind for a moment, I saw what she was seeing, the relentless water that had closed in an instant over her child. Then she looked back at me suddenly. Can you help me? She asked. No, I whispered. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Why are you here? I thought I was alone. I was sure I was all alone out here. I'm visiting my gra- I began and then stopped. I went to where she stood. I'm here because I'm losing someone too, I told her. And I know you can't help me either, but I don't want to be all alone. That night when my father called my grandparents' house and said once more that there was no change, I told them I was coming home. It was raining at last. When disapproving, they took me to the train station the next day. Not a downpour that would revitalize the earth and the ruined landscape, but a steady drizzle that cooled us, that softened the dry set lines in my grandmother's face, and was better than nothing at all. My mother did not die, not then. And I did not go to college, not that September. Instead, I stayed at home with my mother as she gradually grew stronger. Together we read aloud and laughed, and she sat watching while I painted our kitchen bright blue. Then she hemmed by hand the new curtains I made from a fabric as vibrantly colored as rainbows. The Harrington's daughter killed herself. Took her own life, is the way grandmother put it in a letter. She enclosed the newspaper clipping that used the same phrase. I don't know how. I'm just as glad to not know. Not knowing, I can imagine that she found a place that looked, that felt, like the place where all she had lost had gone. And she slid into it, cool and welcome and unalone. Her name was Sigrid Harrington. I had mistaken the sound for secret. And, as she had predicted, I did eventually have children of my own. In years to come, I would encounter other secrets and would grow to understand the wish to draw the shades against them. Sometimes the memory of the Harrington's daughter kept me from doing so. I wish I could thank her for that gift. 
the way she thanked me for my small and helpless offering of flowers.